Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, North America's first place city. And in this episode, as we have in the last two, we're talking about the evolution here of our historic cemeteries, principally St. Michael's and St. John's. And in the first uh, episode, we, we've given basically the background of uh, St. Michael's and, of course, some of the background on funerary customs as they evolved here in the 19th century. And now we want to talk a little bit more about St. John's Cemetery, which, which came into being in the 1870s. Now, it's important for us to recognize why we started or why the Masons started a new cemetery. We were in the middle of a period of great growth. The 1870s were a boom area for Pens or boom era for Pensacola. And at this time, uh, we, were, we had unfortunately some friction, some difficulties between Protestants and Catholics in the community. And the Masons felt more comfortable with having a cemetery where they specifically their members could go. And so the Masons worked with the city of Pensacola and they established a plot of 28 acres on the west side. If you want a, a, an easy uh, benchmark and finding it, uh, basically where G Street inter intersects with Belmont, and basically that is where the cemetery's entrance is. Now, as they started the cemetery, the, the Masons were very particular about what they were going to do. They wanted to make sure that certain fundamental needs of the community were going to be met. And this is a time, of course, with a great deal of maritime uh, 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 currency back and forth in the community. A lot of, of people who were uh, on sailing vessels were coming here, and unfortunately there were accidents and deaths, and some of them died here. And so the Masons set up a, a segment, a, a plot that was specifically for men of the of maritime uh, background who might die here, and they are were are were buried in that particular area. Secondly, they were they noted that th this was a time when the when infant mortality was exceptionally high, and we had a number of of course infant uh, deaths at this time, and there also was the problem of uh, of young children who were literally abandoned. And so the Masons set up a section of the cemetery where children of both, of both elements could be buried, and that is still there and well cared for today. Uh, going beyond that, they set up a small section where men who were men in the Masonic order who came here as visitors and who might happen to die here, they were, they were, they were laid to rest in a special section that marked off specifically for them. Okay, the, now the, the cemetery itself was done very beautifully, very geographically uh, laid out, so that there were, they were, it was done by sections with streets through it so that could, people could easily move back and forth, which of course was something that had not been the case in the in St. Michael's Cemetery. And as, as the burials began, we began to see a change. Now, when one visits these two cemeteries, it's, one, it's a, a point of, in, of reference that you, you may want to make note of. First of all, the St. Michael's Cemetery is, is for the most part, has burials there of people who were, who were citizens and some who were very prominent between 1808 and the latter part of the 19th century. Now, there, there have been burials in the 20th century or were burials in the 20th century, and there may be some more in this coming, in, this, in the present cemetery. But basically, the, the 19th century, we could say, was the cemetery, was the era, the century for St. Michael's. In St. John's, it's quite different. Uh, we, the, the basic thing we can look at, basic uh, uh, structure there is looking for people whose, whose uh, activities began in the, the Civil War period. And we, we, as you will see in a moment, there, were a num there are a number of burials in St. John's who came from the, from the Civil War itself. Now, in, within the cemetery itself, the, the, the funerary art is, is something that we, of course, want to pay particular attention to. It is not basically terribly different from St. Michael's, but there are there are differences, and we, the differences come about because of things that were happening, not necessarily in the United States, but across the water, because late in the 1880s, a, a, the, the idea of archaeology was just beginning to be very, very fashionable. The universities were backing it, and Egyptology became a, a kind of a fad, a, 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 a point of interest that time. And out of Egyptology came a piece of funerary art, which we call the obelisk. This, is, of course, is the long, the tall tower, tall, tall uh, obelisk uh, that is a kind of a, well, it's a kind of a pillar. And basically, the obelisk was popular because it gave the, gave the impression that you were following a modern trend of if you use that in a burial. And also, the sides of it, of course, lent themselves to all kinds of air of space where different kinds of funerary messages could be, uh, could be placed. So if you look through St. Uh, St. John's Cemetery, you're going to find a number of these of varying sizes, and of course, they are, are very well marked. 
Secondly, in, in that cemetery, you're going to see a number of variations of the Christian cross. Now, people had used the, the cross in burial customs for years and years, centuries actually, but we, once again, in this century, in this uh, cemetery, you'll find a, a more modern adaptation of that and some very beautiful work, some of them small, some of them independent, some of them where the cross is uh, incorporated in other forms of masonry, but it's a beautiful part of the, of the uh, decoration there, and you want to, as you make your tour through, take a good look at that as well. Now, within this cemetery, you begin to see the utilization of specialization. In this area, in this cemetery, we have sections of the cemetery itself that were, were, were laid out to, to identify different ethnic groups. You'll find people who are German, who are English, who are Slovakian, who are Italian, who are, who, uh, who are all of these, who are Greek. All of these people, all these little sections are there. Now, they're not fenced off and where we say this is a German section or anything like that, but it was just the, the, the people who of that uh, ethnic background uh, 100 years ago felt it was, it was proper and they, they wanted to be with the buried with the people of their same background, and they were. And consequently, as you make your tour through, you will see that that is, is in, in part, is what you will see in the cemetery. Now, of course, in this cemetery, people have been buried who have many different interests. And it is, I think, most important for us to recognize how prominent some of these people were. For example, there are three separate, there are three different Civil War generals who were laid there, General French, General Miller, and General Perry. Now, of course, this is the same Perry who was a governor of the state of Florida, and our, we recognize, of course, the, the Perry House in downtown Pensacola as part of that family's legacy. Now, going beyond that, there are, were two members of the Florida Supreme Court, uh, uh, Mr. Maxwell and Mr. Anderson, both of whom served in the 19th century. Both of them are buried in this area. There are 10 different men buried here who were mayors of the city of Pensacola, some of them stretching way back, some of them going into the middle of the 20th century. In addition to that, there are two former superintendents of schools and uh, more than 60 men and women who were educators in the, in the Escambia County public school system. Now, beyond that, of course, there were industrialists. Carl Weiss, the uh, man who for many, many years uh, led the Weiss uh, Fricker uh, Mahogany Company. He is buried there. Uh, the Pace family is represented there because, of course, the Paces were very, very in instrumental in a number of not only commerce, but uh, but in industry at St. Regis Paper Company. They are, they are represented here as well. The Fleming family, including Jim Fleming, who was a, a manufacturer, they are there. And of course, going beyond that, we have both uh, Simpson Reese and Wright Reese, who were uh, the, at the very top of the pyramid of, uh, of banking. They are both laid in. By the way, Wright Reese, for many years, was, a, was of course, he was a very, very strong mason. And for many years, uh, Mr. Wright Reese almost uh, single-handedly took care of the administrative manners, matters of handling the, the uh, operation of this cemetery. Now, beyond that, of course, you've got a number of families. I apologize for doing it, but I, I don't want to leave anybody out if I can from this list. But we have members of the Bars family. We have the, the Hilton Green family, the Brown family, uh, Richard and Charlie Turner, the prominent builders who did so much of the, the major construction in uh, downtown Pensacola over many years. Uh, Mr. A.V. Clubs, another one of the great contractors and also a, a, a paramount leader in the school system. And then, of course, there was Dr. W.C. Payne Sr. And Dr. Payne, uh, of all the physicians who we uh, represent, who represent medicine in the, tw in the 20th century, is certainly worthy of, of mention because his, his monument there is a very significant one. Okay. Now, as you go through this through the cemetery, and you'll see this a little bit in St. Michael's as well, but it is much more prominent in uh, in St. John's. You're going to see the use of, of uh, insignia from various uh, various clubs and lodges on the memorials to the individuals. Now, we can, today uh, we can appreciate uh, how this may have been, but but I think it, it, they, there was much more emphasis on it, uh, at least a personal involvement, when the time that we're talking about over a hundred years. Ago. Go. Today we have rot Rotary and Kiwanis and Civitans and Sertoma and so forth. Back, but, but back 125 years ago, uh, these organizations didn't exist. But most men in business or in the profession to those times would have been a, a, a member of at least one of these orders and perhaps more. And once again, the, these are, are, are orders that were of some size, not just in Pensacola, but across the world. Now, of course, the Knights of Columbus were such an order, but basically those members were, would not be uh, generally in St. John's, they would have been in St. Michael's. But when we look at some of the others, we, we come to the, to, first of all, the Masonic order itself, then we've got the Woodman of the World,
world. We've got the elks. We've got the moose. Uh, we've got the uh, we've got half a dozen others, all of which were the kinds of things that uh, people that men wanted to belong to because it was a, a social organization. But many times there were other parts of it as well. Now the Masonic Order, of course, was worldwide. It had it had been around for for more than two centuries, and there were many 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 and people in Pensacola who were members of that order, and their wives were members as well in, in the what was called the Order of the Eastern Star. And when you go throughout the St. John's Cemetery from place to place to place, you're going to see many uh, gravestones where the Masonic emblem is there. And in some cases, you're also going to see a representation of, of how long that individual was in the order and even the, uh, the level within the order to which he had risen. And now the same is true pretty much of the woodmen of the world. Woodmen, uh, woodmen are still around. They, they still have their a, a little different operation today. They are more of a, an insurance organization today. But the woodmen of the world were an association that what basically men joined it for protection and for fellowship. And basically what they, if you were a successful member of that organization, one of the benefits you got was a gravestone given to you at the time of your burial. Now, if you go out into St. John's Cemetery, you're going to see a number of these uh, woodmen of the world gravestones, and they are shaped like a tree stump. The stump will be maybe that high or that high or that high. It'll be, the larger the stump, uh, the higher the individual uh, that, that is buried on that site will have gone in the order. And of course, uh, uh, etched into the, the stump itself are the critical data on the individual, who he was, where he was, and so forth. So the woodmen of the world are represented that way in, on funerary art. Then again, you, you move to the other orders. Also, they, they also had symbols. And you will find as you go from, uh, from gravestone to gravestone, you will see the elks and the, and the moose and so forth represented in that same way. <clears throat> and there were a few people, not many, but a few people who wanted to have represented it on their stone. Uh, the fact that they were in not more than, not one, but just two. And in a very, very few cases, there were p people I could find out there who had been part of three different op uh, organizations like three different lodges. And so that is part of the funerary arch you're going to see as you go through St. John's. Now, uh, the, the, the plots themselves are laid out very much like the ones in St. Michael's, except that generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, you will find the, the burial site somewhat larger here than it was in the St. Michael's. St. Michael's, of course, was, uh, had, uh, they had sold off a, a good deal of the original acreage so that the burial sites side to side are a little bit narrower. And in St. John's, they are a little bit wider. And of course, the, the, the foresight of having streets cut through so that people can move back and forth between the sections have made the, the cemetery uh, easier to visit. Now, as you look through the, the, uh, the balance of the, the cemetery, here, you begin to, to get the idea that people have cared about uh, landscaping. Now, the, when they, when they, of course, when they uh, obtained the original site, it was uh, just beautifully covered with trees, that many of which had been around for a long, long time. And the the people over over time who have cared for the cemetery have made sure that they that these were protected. Now, unfortunately, when Hurricane Ivan struck us in in 2004, that cemetery, like St. Michael's and every everything else in uh, Escambia County, was badly damaged. And uh, a lot of volunteers and the friends of the of the St. John Cemetery spent countless hours uh, remedying the problems, and they've done a beautiful job. And leaving it uh, to the time with, uh, when we actually make this, uh, put this episode on film, uh, that work continues. And the cemetery is a, a beautiful place. It's lovely to visit, uh, particularly on a sunlit afternoon, uh, walking back and forth down the streets. And you can see how what great care a great many families take in, pr in making sure that the plots are beautifully cared for. And of course, the, the manicuring of the lawns and so forth is part of this. Now, in our final episode, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about something that uh, many of you have seen as you went from, from cemetery to cemetery, and that is what I call funerary art in terms of flowers and other things. Because people have seen it and they said, well, it isn't that pretty, but it, it meant more than that in days past.